Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. My name is Sarah Odsley, and I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center. Thanks so much for joining us from wherever you are in the world and in whatever time zone you're in on this really um, beautiful morning to be here with um, virtual visiting writer Tiana Clark for her craft talk. Tiana Clark is the author of the poetry collection, I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood, winner of the 2017 Agnes Lynch Star at Prize and Equilibrium, selected by Afa Michael Weaver for the 2016 Frost Place Poetry Chatbook Competition. Um, sorry, I'm just letting a few more people in from the chat. Tiana is the winner of the 2020 Kate's, Kate Tufts Discovery Award, a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow, a recipient of a 2019 Pushcart Prize, a winner of the 2017 Furious Flowers Gwendolyn Brooks Centennial Poetry Prize, and the 2015 Rattle Poetry Prize. She is the 2017-2018 J.C. and Ruth Hall's Poetry Fellow at the Wisconsin Institute of Creative Writing. She is also re the recipient of scholarships and fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, Suwani Writers Conference, and Kenyan Review Writers Workshop. She is a graduate of Vanderbilt University and Tennessee State University, where she studied Africana and Women's Studies. Her writing has appeared or it is forthcoming from The New Yorker, Poetry, The Washington Post, BQR, Tin House Online, Kenyon Review, BuzzFeed News, American Poetry Review, New England Review, Oxford American, Best New Poets, 2015 and elsewhere. She teaches <clears throat> creative writing at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville and will be the Smith College Writer in Residence in Massachusetts. Um, I'm looking forward to having her in New England. And she will also be the Amy Lowell, um, also received an Amy Lowell um, traveling scholarship. So after her Smith College Writer in Residence, she'll be um, abroad for an entire year, which yeah. sounds wonderful and fantastic. And I look forward to the work that comes from that. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Tiana. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sarah and the Vermont Studio Center. I'm so Excited to be here and thank you all for joining. What a robust group. I'm seeing so many lovely faces and names that I know. I really appreciate y'all being here. I know there's so many Zoom events throughout the week. Even I, every morning, I'm like, what am I doing? What's happening? So I appreciate your gift of attention and time. Um, this will be a generative writing workshop. Um, I'm going to be talking about making and breaking forms. It's something that's really important to me. Um, so we're going to be looking at the hustle today, um, that form, and we're going to do some writing exercises. Before we get started, I always like to start off with a poem. When I was in high school, my favorite um, teacher, Bill Brown, he would always just start class with a poem and just get language in the air and words in the air. And I just like to kind of have that um, to carry on his tradition of my first creative writing teacher and the reason that I'm a poet today. So I'm going to share my screen. This um, was um, a poem that Major Jackson had the other day on poets.org. I don't know if y'all, um, you know, I'm sure most of you, I see everyone in here seems like an avid poetry fan. So I'm sure most of us wake up, you know, and read um, our poets.org um, emails. Does everyone see the poem from Major Jackson? Yes. Sorry, great. Let me begin again. Let me begin again as a quiet thought in the shape of a shell slowly examined by a brown child on a beach at dawn, straining to see their future. Let me begin this time knowing the drumming in my dreams is me inheriting the earth is morning lighting up the rivers. Let me burn my vanities, old music in the pines, sifters of scotch, a day moon like a signature of night. This time, let me circle the island of my fears only once, then live like a raging waterfall and grow a magnificent mustache. Let me not ever be the birdcage or the serrated blade or the empty season. Dear glacier, dear sea of stars, dear lepers disintegrating at the outer limits of our greed. Soon we will encounter you only in motivational tweets. Reader, I should have married you sooner. This time, let me not sleep like the prophet who believes he's seen infinity. Let me run at breakneck speeds toward sceneries of doubt. I have no more dress rehearsals to attend. Look closer, I'm licking my lips. I love this moment mm -hmm. when, when uh, Major Jackson says, reader, I should have married you sooner. I posted this the other day on my social media and someone asked me, why do you like that line? And I think for me, this has nothing to do with my craft talk. I'm just sh sharing my little comments for you real quick. Um, I think so often when we 
write, I think we have this idea that we have to be so opaque to our readers, right? And I think for a long time, I kept my reader really far away from me. Um, mm. And I like this idea of reader, I should have married you, like I should have invited you into this intimacy sooner, right? Like, what are we afraid of from our audience? What are we afraid of from our readers? And I love this quick immediate, immediacy to the, to the audience that like, I should have, what was I afraid of? And I feel like so much of our work, we're trying to share those really vulnerable places in our work, right? And I just love this moment where the speaker says, reader, I should have married you sooner. And I love this, like, I'm licking my lips at the end. Um, and one thing I love about this feature, if you haven't signed up for the, the poem of day, please do, but, oh, it's gone. Oh, here it is right here. They can write about, about the poem. And I love this last line that Major Jackson has. Um, this poem, which is inspired by Philip Levine's poem of the same title, quite seriously, gifts the reader that sustaining image, a black child and wondrous thought. Also, if you want a quick writing assignment, this Let Me Begin Again is like a reboot of a narrative. And so there's another poem by Terrence Hayes called The Same City that does the same reboot. He tells a story kind of three times. So that could be a quick writing prompt for you to take home of, what would it mean to have a poem where you let me begin again, let me begin again. Um, so what I like to do before I start any workshop is I want to invite, who are those permission giving artists for you into this space? Um, and you can fill up the chat. I'd love to see just from the chat, who are those um, either visual artists, poets, fiction writers, whatever, who are those artists that you admire, but specifically what sense of permission do they give you? Um, so I'd love to just see a couple, just like put it in the chat. Who are those poets? Like for me, Terrence Hayes is one of those poets. He's, he's someone that I feel like is actively making and breaking forms. I think about American sonnets, past and future assassins. It's making me rethink the psychology of a sonnet and what a sonnet can do. Um, and y'all, Sarah's so awesome with the links. <laughs> um, June Jordan, Jacob Brown, Patricia Smith. Yes, yes. Nikki Finney. Yes. Um, and if y'all can say a little bit, maybe why. Yes, I love Jennifer Ellen Knox. Yes. Vibe Francis, Annie Dillard. Yes. What about, and then, and maybe even to yourself, if you want to put a little bit in the chat, what specifically, what kind of permission do they specifically give you to do in your work? Did Smith, yes. And so what we're doing, we're creating um, our, our CEO, uh, creative board of directors, the poet of terror and personification. Yes, AI, yes. Um, I love that. As we're writing today, and you might get stuck, um, think about pulling on those artists that give you permission, right? Um, I love that, Victoria. It gives me permission to break the rules of a narrative, to tell a truer narrative. I love that. Permission to step up and try. Yes. And to delight. Absolutely. Ross Gay. King of delight, right? So as we're writing today and you might be feeling stuck or even just take that with you in your practice, I always try to invite those writers that I love. And I think of them as my permission giving board of directors of how can you lean on those people in your work today? So those are, they're kind of hovering on our shoulders as we're writing. So I love seeing that. And I feel like I'm in a good group. You all are naming writers that are really important. Morgan Parker, yes, her use of the image is continuously making me a better poet and opening my imagination. Yes. Yes, Lady Longshoulder, recasting existing language. Absolutely. Yes. We have a good group today. What a glorious group of people that are in our chat that will help us. Um, okay, so I want to quickly talk about what is your relationship to form and your history to form? And I'm going to tell a little bit of my story. And as I'm telling my story, if you feel like sharing in the chat, I'd love to hear from a couple of people or I'm happy to open it up just to hear from maybe one or two people. Um, I'll say quickly for me, uh, in high school, my my poetry teacher was a kind of a, a retired hippie. He grew up in the beat generation, you know, with Ginsburg and Frank O'Hara. So I was really introduced in a really free flowing, free verse narrative style tradition, which I love. That's how I started in poetry. Um, and it wasn't until I got to Vanderbilt where I started studying received form. And I'm gonna be honest with y'all, I, I was terrified to write a sonnet. I was terrified to write a pantoum. I don't know if anyone else had that fear out there. And the root of that fear is I felt like if I wrote a pantoum and failed, or if I couldn't write a sonnet, then I wasn't a real poet. Has, did anyone else kind of feel that imposter syndrome? And I, yes, thank you, Sarah. Like I had this deep fear that if I, I knew that I had an ear for language and it was instinctual for me. I often think about, you know, jazz musicians that can kind of play by ear, but they don't know how to read the sheet music. And sometimes you can feel really inferior that, okay, I didn't really understand scansion. I didn't really understand how to break down form. And I honestly, like, I would feel like I would feel an algebra, like my body get, would get really hot and um, I would get really terrified. So then when I started addressing what my fears are, which I think are, is really important, I was like, Tiana, let's, let's write a sonnet and see what happens. And something really amazing happened where I once saw fear and form, I found freedom because when I started messing with the sonnet and I started writing in form and then breaking out of form, that tension and that shift of surprise 
Um, Charles Olson talks about this uh, a lot in the Oach Productive Verse of like those energetic shifts that can happen in your work. I started realizing that I actually love playing and manipulating and modulating with form. And for me, it, it's kind of going back to Audre Lorde's idea of like dismantling the master. She says you can't dismantle the master shots, but I think you actually can because I love looking at the traditional kind of these old school forms and totally like breaking shit up. Like I love going inside of a sonnet. You know, John Dunn says we build in sonnet pretty rooms. What if you want to totally wreck that room, right? And what if you take that old form and then you and then you just like go ham in it? And so, so there was something for me that was really powerful about starting in form, starting with that old tradition and then getting radical and getting rebellious and breaking all these poetry conventions. You know, there's an old adage like you can't, you know, you have to know the rules before you break the rules. And I'm like, I think you have to know the rules while you're breaking the rules. That's how I kind of view it. Um, and so I really want to look at the Huzzle format today and, and look at that form, the history of that form. And we're going to look at a couple of Huzzles that I, that I really love. Um, and then we're going to write in form and then break out of it. And I want to see what those kind of shifts feel like for you. But really quickly, does anyone have a quick story of maybe their relationship to form? I'd love to hear from one or two people. Did you feel that fear? Did you have have you felt uncomfortable in form and why do you feel uncomfortable in form because i feel like this is a really shared thing that we don't often talk about or i i feel like i i hear it with my friends you know like quietly but i really haven't seen a lot of people talk kind of broadly about this and i'd love to feel one number one i'd love to feel like i'm not alone <laughs> jasmine hi hi jasmine um nice to meet you nice um meet you. Uh, and hi to everybody. But um, so I recently was accepted to an MFA program and I um, thank you. I had a, a lot of imposter syndrome for like um, a few weeks um, after I was accepted because I was like, I don't know, form was is really difficult. Um, there's only five other poets in my program. So um how did I get here? Uh, and they're like established poets too. And I am just graduating from my undergrad. So it was very overwhelming to be accepted to a program and then realize that, cause you know, I'm Snoopy. So I went and looked at their poetry and they have like, they have a form, they have a, a voice. Mm -hmm. and I, I have a voice and I like form, but sometimes I get really, lost in that you know with, with poetry it's about um at least for me I've understood poetry to be about the p particularities like everything's a choice and so sometimes I get really wrapped up in how can I make my form work for my poem to the best of its ability yeah. and you know sometimes that's really exhausting and I say sometimes I mean like all the time every time I I look at a poem it's every time I I will have an idea in my head and then I'll have to go wait stop I don't know how I'm gonna write this yeah or if this should be like an essay or you know maybe some prose and then I'll psych myself out yeah um, yeah thank you Jasmine well I think you're bringing up the glorious hard work and the questions that we all wrestle with all the time. Um, and for me, where I once found exhaustion, I, I think that to me is like our glorious assignment, right? Of always, whenever I'm writing, I'm like, what is this? It's the number one question. <laughs> and then for me, I also love the dilation sometimes between poetry and prose and I write both. And so sometimes I like what that does to my work too. Um, uh, I love what you said about looking at other people's work and sometimes feeling that inf inferiority. And I have felt that too. Uh, you know, I, I, for a long time felt really weird that I didn't write about the pastoral landscape. I was like, maybe I want to be a black Wendell Berry or a black Mary Oliver, but we all write from the landscapes that we know. Right. Um, and when I started just figuring out what I wanted to do, um, and becoming more of myself on the page that became really powerful for me. Um, so I really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing and uh, I encourage you on your journey and I'll share very quickly in my first MFA writing experience, my very first workshop, I'll never forget. I, I wanted to go first. I was so excited and um, they all took a big fat crap on my poem. They hated it. Um, they all said that I was taking risks that weren't working. I ended my poem with the question, why would I ever do that? I left. First of all, y'all, I just want to know, I entered that workshop. I like quoted my Angelo to myself. I walked in. I was so excited. And then I left absolutely, utterly in tears, crying all the way home. And I edited my poem off of all of their comments. 
for two weeks. Um, and then I kept on getting this phone call and it was from a number I didn't recognize. So I didn't answer it. And then finally I got this email and it said, dear Tiana, um, you won the rattle poetry prize for a single poem for $10,000. And it was the exact poem that I was editing off of the comments and workshop. And this particular editor was saying, I love the risk that you're taking. And I want to see validate that. And it was a moment to me that the workshop is a voice, but it's not the voice. Right. Um, and that was me trusting in my, in my own self. And it, and it realized for me that Obviously in workshop, you know, those trusted readers. And sometimes in workshop, when people are doing things that they've noticed things in your work that make them uncomfortable, that was actually a sign for me that my poem was on the right path. And then if you might know my bitch better have my money poem, I was literally told not to publish that poem, that that poem scared a particular professor of mine. That poem ended up winning a pushcart prize if I had listened to that professor. I'm not saying this to toot my own teats or whatever, whatever the, but I'm just saying that like, Following your own instincts and the risks that you take can be really rewarding. Um, okay, there was a comment up here um, that I really want to read. Okay, is it Thea or Taya? I should know, is it Thea, the first one? It's Thea. Yeah, okay. I should know that because I adore you. <laughs> um, I totally felt that fear and imposter syndrome, um, hence I balked at attaining an uh, MFA and applying for years. And honestly, Tina Chang was the catalyst for finding this freedom and form. So did you end up getting an MFA? I did. Well, I haven't attained yet. I'm in, I'm still first year at NYU. Woo, yes. I'm at NYU right now in their MFA program. And so my first semester was uh, last semester. So this, yeah. And um, Rachel Zucker brought in Tina Chang who wrote Hybrida. And what Tina said, she just had so much love for form and she was utilizing this old Japanese form um, for just the complex themes that she was bringing in Hybrida. And to me, for whatever reason, that set fire under my ass of like, wow, like there can be this freedom and that paradox, right? Where once I can be honest with the parameters or have or implement parameters and have limitations, yeah. then suddenly things become boundless and I can then tap into complex themes, say stories that I could not perhaps say otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, <clears throat> I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And you mentioned something that's really important also with Gail, you're bringing up in the chat, the box of a received form tends to distract me from good content, or that's my fear. And I think to your point, um, Thea, is that like, sometimes we feel like, oh, it's gonna, it's gonna be like the stop sign or this like, um, it's gonna inhibit me in some way. But often sometimes when you have really hot contact content, or maybe a traumatic experience, or, or maybe there's those poems that you know that haven't worked, that mm -hmm. are kind of stuck, and they're buffering. Sometimes siphoning that buffering content inside the box of a form can help you ricochet um, those places in your psyche that are stuck, right? Yeah. And that's what's happened to me is sometimes like, so let's say we take a Sestina with that obsessive listing and twisting and somehow that unlocks a stuck poem for you, you know? Or maybe in your revision process, you throw it in a Sestina. It doesn't stay a Sestina, but somehow that that gets it unstuck, right? It's like Drano. Um, and then the, the poem starts flowing again. This is great. I'm glad I'm not alone from this. Okay, so let's look at, um, does everyone have the packet? I know that Sarah dropped it in the chat. I'll also share my screen as well, but I just wanna make sure um, that everyone has the packet. Um, I wanna look at uh, the Huzzle format. Um, are y'all familiar with the, with the Huzzle or most people? <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and as I share my screen, um, so I'm going to look at a really famous one. Um, does everyone see even the rain? Is it showing Sarah? Okay, great. Um, oh, let me get a little bit bigger. Zoom University. Okay, just a little quick background. Um, you know, the, I think in America we say guzzle, but I think the pronunciation is like huzzle. Um, so it's an Arabic verse dealing with romantic loss. Um, it's a, med a medieval form um, that embraced this idea of um, syntactically and grammatically complete couplets. The form also has an intricate rhyme scheme. Each couplet ends on the same word or phrase called the radif. And we'll, we'll go through all this. I just kind of want to give a brief um, background. And it's preceded by the couplet's rhyming word. Um, so it dates back to the seventh century in Arabia, it flourished in Arabic, Persian, uh, Rumi, Hafiz were really popular um, in writing this form as well. Um, it's an offshoot of the praise poem. It's traditional about an unrequited lover often blurring spiritual and physical love. 
one definition I really love is that it's the the name comes from the sound of a gazelle when it knows it's being hunted and it's about to die, which I think is like what an intense way to name a form. Um, but often the traditional huzzles were kind of meaning sweet talk or talk of boys and girls kind of wooing one another, right? Um, and that Ali says that it's always has the atmosphere of grief or sadness in the form filled with ravishing divinities, which he has a really great collection of guzzles in that book. Um, so the main thing is that they can either be a, a, a guzzle that has a strict unit or disunity. It usually always has end stop lines, the strict format. It's always written in couplets. There's always a rat up, a repeating phrase. So here in this poem, the first couplet, even the rain, even the rain, that's the rat up that's going to be repeated throughout the poem. In the first couplet, it's repeated twice. And then in the subsequent couplets, it's only in the second line. Um, so each couplet in the guzzle is called a sheer. And then at the end, um, the name of the poet is always mentioned in some way, some kind of direct address to the poet. Um, and we'll read this poem together and then we can kind of break down what this looks like. I have a little fancy, fancy kind of uh, my highlighting here to kind of show you the breakdown of the hustle format. So I don't know how this is gonna work. I've done it in class format, Shelly's done it with me. I don't know how it's gonna work over Zoom, but we're gonna try and just, we're gonna see. And if it's a hot mess, it'll be a hot mess. But I would love for everyone to unmute themselves. And what we're gonna do, if you want to, if you wanna participate. Typically how it would be done back in the day is that the person with the guzzle would read the lines, but the audience would read the radif together. Again, this could be a hot mess with different delays in the Wi-Fi, but we're just gonna see, we're just gonna go with it. Now, remember when you're reading the radifs, be sure to follow the, the punctuation, right? So if it's a question, I wanna hear that lilt at the end, right? Um, so let's read this together and y'all will read the radif lines and we'll just see what happens, okay? Great, even the rain. What will suffice for a true love knot? Even the rain. Even the rain. The rain. The rain. <laughs> but, he, but he has brought grief's lottery. Bought. Even, even the, the rain. rain. The rain. Great. Our glosses wanting in this world. Can you remember anyone when we thought the poets taught? Even, even the, the rain. 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 We died. That was it. God left us in the dark. And as we forgot the dark, we forgot. Even, even the, the rain. 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 Over. Where was I? Drinks were on the house. For mixers, my love. You poured what? Even the rain. the rain. I love it. Keep the stamina guard. Of this pear shape oranges perfume twist, I will say extract vermouth from the bergamot. Even, Even the, the rain. 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 The enemy love you with air, with earth, air, and fire. He held just one thing back till he got. Even the, the rain. 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 Pause on that colon. Thank you. This is God's sight for a new house of executions. You swear by the Bible, despot. Even, oh, Even, Even the, the rain. 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 After the bones, those flowers, this was found in the urn, the lost river, ashes from the got. Even the rain, the rain. rain. What was I to prophecy, if not the end of the world, a salt pillar for the lonely knot? Even, Even the, the rain. rain. How the air raged, disparate, streaming the earth with flames to help burn down my house, fire sought. Even, Even the, rain. the rain. He would raise the mountains, he would level the waves, he would to smooth his epic plot. Even the Even rain. The the rain. rain. York belongs at daybreak to only me, just me, to make this claim memories brought. Even, Even the, the rain. rain. I found the knife that killed you, but whose prints are these? No one has such small hands, Shahid. Not, Not even the, the rain. rain. Beautiful. You know what? That went way better than I thought it would. It was almost like a, a, a weird droning chorus of the Rada, um, which was wonderful. Um, so just to kind of break down again how the format looks like, um, we have the couplets, and then the radif is repeated twice in the first couplet, and then the radif is only in the second line of each subsequent couplet. There's also something called the kafta, which is there's an internal rhyme scheme that's happening. So I've not bought, taught, forgot, uh, what bergamot kind of happening in the middle here or towards the end, and then we have right the there's a direct address to the poet. No one has such small hands, Shahid, not even the rain. So those are kind of the main elements of a, of a hustle. Um, so I want to look at three poets that are kind of taking the hustle and making it their own and look at some different strategies as we kind of think about writing your own hustle and then how to break out of that form and what breaking out of that form kind of feels like. Um, so let's look at this poem from Natasha Trethaway, Miscegenation. So here, so this one had in stopped lines. Um, each couplet was kind of in disunity. Here, Natasha it um, starts to use some enjambment and also um, it has a continuous story. Do I have a volunteer who would want to read Miscegenation by Natasha Trethaway? Also, I can't see anyone. So maybe Sarah, you can help me call on someone. First, I'm raising my screen. I, I will, Tiana. Thank you, Shelly. Okay. 
Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Thank you, Shelly. That was beautiful. Um, and so let me share a different screen um, where I kind of break down this poem a little bit. Um, so what's the, the radif in this poem? Mississippi. Mississippi, like Mississippi. Right. right. And then, but what's also happening with that rat up, that sense of repetition in terms of the title, like for me, Mississippi and miscegenation start forming and merging together, right? I mean, we even have it in that second uh, uh, group of couplets, like that Miss and Mississippi. Uh, and so here, um, Natasha's kind of following somewhat of the strict format, right? Mississippi's are repeated twice. Then she's also doing something interesting with this like name, same, name, name, same. So that that Kafta comes to the end of the lines here. And then we're that repetition is again making us equate name, same, name, same Mississippi miscegenation again and again and again, right? Um, then this is a continuous one where we're kind of told a narrative about the kind of origin story of her of her parents, right? Makes me think about Sharon Old's like come what may and, and, and that origin story. And then again we have the reference to the name, right? Um, I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I am not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Um, so here in Jamit is starting to be used, right? Like name begins, same as slaves, name for the day. Um, and that's a, a way too, to think about, do you want to do end stop lines or do you want to play with some enjambment and the kind of waterfall effect kind of inside your poems? Um, I also want to briefly look at um, a poem that I did um, I don't want to read this poem because I, I don't know how I feel about poetry in their own work, but in a, in a workshop. But I just want to show that um, this is a, a puzzle that I wrote back in the day, and I started in really a strict format. And I was working with Ross Gay, and I was having trouble with this poem. And he was like, just break the form. And I was like, you can do that. And he was like, yeah, just break it. And I just wanted to show visually what you can see me starting in the form. And I broke out of it here. And then the back started kind of going more towards the, the middle of the poem, right? Um, and then I kind of was wanting to play with this idea of chiasmus of like having this repetition play in different ways as well. And so I just wanted to show you in different ways how, how that form can kind of break loose for you. Um, and especially if you start kind of diagramming your poems like this, I think really interesting things can kind of happen. Uh, and for me, this particular poem, which is about Walter Scott dying into the hands of police brutality, the form actually mimics what's happening with the broken black body under like the, the boot of the police. And so that's what some ways where the form can mirror the content. And so for me, again, going back to that idea that I was really afraid of form, when I started playing with form, it actually started adding some depth and nuance to my work. Um, and it started showing more than, I, than even what I was wanting to tell, right? We're always like, how do we show? How do we show? Um, so the form here was something that was really helpful for me. Um, and I really wanted this form to kind of mimic that obsessiveness, right? That we can watch a, a man die at infinitum again and again in that sense of viral death, right? And to me, a form that's about the gazelle being hunted and about this obsessive listening. Um, and I also wanted to implicate myself in this poem that Tiana, you've got to stop watching this video. Like I was wanting to implicate me, like why are you watching something that's gonna damage your psyche in this way? Um, so calling myself out and that self-implication was really, really important. Um, let's look at this one from uh, Patricia Smith, um, who is really playing around with sonics in a different way. And do I have a volunteer to read the um, Patricia Smith poem? I'll read it. Thank you. 
So Hip Hop Puzzle by Patricia Smith. Gotta love us brown girls, munching on fat, swinging blue hips, decked out in shells and splashes, Lottie bringing them woo hips. As the jukebox teases, watch my sisters throat the heartbreak, inhaling baseline, cracking backbone and singing through hips. Like something boneless, we glide silent, seeping tween floorboards, wrapping around the hymns and the ooh-wee clinging like glue hips. Engines grinding, rotating, smoking, gotta pull back some. Natural minds are lost at the mere sight of ringing true hips. Gotta love us girls just strutting down Manhattan streets, killing the men folk with a dose of that stinging view. Hips, crying about getting old. Patricia, you need to get up off what God gave you. Say a prayer and start slinging. Cue hips. Great reading, thank you so much. This one's very musical for me, right? Um, and so here we have already, Patricia starts kind of breaking the form a little bit, right? So hips is the radical, we have blue hips and woo hips, right? And then through hips, glue hips, true hips. And then I love the kind of break here syntactically with the grammar of view, period, hips, period which is something I always think about in form of how can you start having those variations and start messing with the punctuation a little bit to kind of, to me, it's all about fulfilling and thwarting the reader's expectations. So they're starting to expect the rat of, but how are you going to thwart that expectation a little bit? I love messing uh, one, right? Surprising myself, but also surprising my readers where what that's what repetition does, right? Repetition, we start to expect what's to come. And then how do we thwart that, right? With a sense of surprise. Um, and then here, Patricia, you need to get off get up off what God gave you, the address to self, say a prayer and start singing two hips. Okay, what I want us to do now is I want you to start at least three couplets in the original format of the Hessel, and I'll, and I'll throw up the example here in just one second. Um, so I'd love for you to start a traditional Hessel format. Do um, you see the writing prompt one here? And so your first couplet with two, ending with two radicals, so a repeating word or phrase. And then maybe you get two more couplets after that. Maybe you can get six lines down. But I'd love to just maybe give us five to six minutes. I know that won't be a lot of time, but just get as far as you can. But I'd love for you to start in the traditional format of a, of a puzzle and not break out of it yet, but to start in that strict format. Um, sometimes it's easier for me to start with what I want my rat up to be. So I might start just brainstorming different words that are like popping up to me or a phrase that might be popping up to you. And I kind of think of putting it as a stop sign at the end of the street. And how am I writing towards that stop sign? How am I writing towards that stop sign? So maybe you can get three couplets down. And that first couplet, the rat we repeated twice at the end. And then in your subse subsequent couplets, it'll just be in that second line. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I'm gonna mute myself. We'll give it about five minutes and just start that traditional, that traditional couplet.
about a minute and a half left and I'm not giving you a lot of time. Um, but also if you feel like putting your rat up in the chat, I'd love to see what some of the rat ups are that you're working with. There's some beautiful rat ups in here. I feel like it's making its own poem in the chat. <laughs> right here in the water, pecoria tree, storm and truck. I mean, it's like, it's beautiful. It's like a found poem. Maybe 30 more seconds, try to finish up your last line. As you're finishing your last line, how did the strict format feel? Did it feel, was it kind of hard? Was it difficult? Was it easy? Did you feel kind of, was it kind of sticky? Anybody? It was difficult, but it's fun, yes. Fun, yeah, great. Also, I wanna mention up here, I like this comment, and then please tell me if I'm pronouncing your name right, Mariah Silberman. I love, I love how you, I might be saying your name wrong. If not, please correct me. I love how you talked about um, Natasha repeating her name twice uh, with that Christmas child. I think that's a really keen observation. Thank you for writing that. Maria, thank you, sorry. Yeah, the first couplet really sets the tone. Yes, apprehensive at first, but got the swing of things quickly. Yeah, I often feel like that kind of happens with every poem, right? <laughs> Okay, let's look at this poem. I felt nervous um, that I wasn't doing it right. See, I want to talk about that. Sometimes I feel like that, right? Like, how do how do we work on that? And that's that's what sometimes form can do. That like we're not doing it right. And then how do we give ourselves permission to be wonky inside of it? Yeah, you know, um, and that we create that sense of right for ourselves, right? Um, I often feel that way too when I'm inside form as well. And then me making my own rules as I go makes me feel really fun. That's what brings the fun for me. Um, okay, let's look at this poem from Fatima Oscar that completely breaks all the rules. Um, and as I'm reading this poem, I really, I really am curious, and I and I really want to get in discussion about this of what happens when you see uh, the speaker in this poem start to shift and change um, and vary that radif in lots of different ways. Um, so look at those shifts when they're happening. And I really want to have a, a quick discussion of what happens when you see the speaker changing the rat up each time. WWE. Can everyone see the poem? Here's your auntie in her best gold threaded shellwear kameez made small by this land of American men. Every day she prays, rolls a ta and pounds the kima all night, watches the bodies of these glistening men. Big and muscular, neck full of veins, bulging in the pen, her eyes cajoled and wide, glued to sweaty American men. She smiles as guilty as a bride without blood, her love of this new country, cold snow, and naked American men. Stop living in a soap opera, yells her husband, fresh from work, demanding his dinner, American. Men take and take, and yet you idolize them still. Watch your auntie as she builds her silent altar to them. Her knees fold on the rundown mattress, a prayer to WWE, her Tezbe and TV, the only thing she puts before her husband. She covers bruises and never lets us eat leftovers, a good wife. It's something in their nature, what America does to men. They can't touch anyone without teeth and spit unless one strips the other of their human skin. Even now you don't get it. But whenever it's on, you watch them snarl like mad dogs in a cage, these American men. Now that you're older, your auntie calls to say he hit her again, but this didn't happen before he became American. You know it's true and try to help, but what can you do? You, little Fatima, who still worships him. And about this poem Fatima wrote, I've always remembered the image, this image from my childhood, my immigrant auntie in her shell or kameez watching World Wrestling Entertainment, there were a lot of women in our family and we would all watch it together. I never really thought that this, that it was strange until I was older. I wanted to write a poem that explored these moments as well as the relationship between us and America and the men and women in my family. 
So I think it's really interesting in this poem. So already from the jump, the first couplet, bottom is already breaking the rules, right? So the radif is not repeated twice. It's just in that second line, we get American men, but she's setting up that's the expectation, right? Then in the second couplet, we have glistening men. Um, so the modifier changes and then it goes kind of back to form. We get American men and then American men, right? Naked, sweaty American. And then, and then again, messing with the punctuation, American period, men and jamment, take and take and take, right? And then we get another kind of bigger break here, altered, altered to them with sonically, there's a slant rhyme there that's reminiscent of the American men. So sonically it's breaking form, but still it's still knitted to the radif, right? And then she puts before her husband, which is so interesting to have alter and then puts before her husband comes right after that. So it's the same conceit, but completely different words, right? And then what America does to men, breaking up the phrase, breaking up the radif a little bit, kind of uh, kind of according it out a little bit. And then another big break, uh, their human skin. Then we go back to the original format. That's another thing to play around with. Maybe you start in form, you break out of form, and then how do you return back to form, right? Kind of like a wave. These American men. And then before he became American, which be, kind of becomes the Volta, right? Because this, this particular penultimate stanza is where we get the domestic violence, right? We find out how all of this transference has happened, right? This didn't happen before he came to America. So the transference of the Radif to what's happened to her uncle, the speaker's uncle, has now all congealed together, right? And then we get that succinct finality in the end, right? With the questions and the and the direct address to the speaker. And it's a little speaker, right? You little Fatima who still worships him. And that's what I love sometimes people talk about name poems with questions. I actually think it's it's really great because I often go into poem not having the answer, but just probing deeper into the problem or deeper into um, the question that I have. Like, what do you do um, with this man that you love that has hurt someone in your family, right? What do you do with that that love that you have? right? When you've seen this happen. Um, so again, that worships him makes us think about American men, glistening men before her husband, and it reinforces that relationship to the rat again and again. I'd love to hear from a couple of people. What did those, that, those radical shifts and breaking the form do for you with this poem? What did you feel like, maybe as listeners, what did that feel like for you to listen to that? Aurora wrote, um, the speaker seems to be resisting the rules of both words of gender of American as rebels against the obedience that America demands of those who are not American and not absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Anybody else have any thoughts? I love how the penultimate share is more specific. The poem is not really about these American men, but this particular one. Yes. Alicia makes you feel jumpy, terrorized, diligent about the appearance of the, of the men. Mm -hmm. Even the fact that she doesn't capitalize American really yeah. speaks to her subject matter. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that as well. Yeah, that's a choice, right? It reinforces the speaker's mm -hmm. viewpoint about this. The punctuation of the poem enforces that statement for me, yeah. Shift in punctuation when the period after American appears in the fifth stanza, yep. Human skin really got me so disembodied and so violent in a way, yes. Okay, what I want you to do is to go back to your traditional um, puzzle. And then now I want you to break out of form. And what I want you to do is think about several ways that you can think about a type of break. So here I kind of have listed out, um, maybe you've gotten your three couplets, maybe you have more or less, whatever, but just begin to break out of that form and several ways that you can break out of it. Maybe you break and then return back to the traditional format. Maybe you break the form altogether and it, it, you go into a completely different subconscious flow. Maybe you do a fourth wall break where you announce your departure. Maybe you can modulate your repetitions or your radifs and vary those shifts like Fatima has done. Um, I still want you though to have some kind of direct address towards the end of your puzzle. I want you to address yourself in some kind of way, have some kind of gesture to the palimpsest form in some way. But um, I, I wrote down here maybe several ways you can break out of form, but I just want to give you permission to break out of form in whatever way feels right to you. Um, and gesture your name somewhere at the end. Maybe you have um, two more couplets and kind of see where the poem takes you. And then I'd love to hear from a couple people. Okay, right away.
someone asked in the chat, still just three stanzas. I don't want to be too prescriptive, whatever, whatever flow you've got. Um, but if you feel yourself approaching the end, just maybe try to gesture your name in some way. Maybe the goal is to get five couplets. It's kind of a traditional puzzle, but whatever feels right for you. About one more minute. Again, I'm sorry about the time crunch, but hopefully this is a start of something we'll return to later. If you haven't made that gesture towards your name, maybe that would be a good time to do it now. Okay, if you're in a flow, keep flowing, but I do want to know a couple things. I'd love to hear from a couple people. I know it's unfinished and you don't have to give all the disclaimers that it's, yeah, we're blah, blah. we all get it, but um, we all can be vulnerable together and I want to create that space. Also, if you want to do all the preamble, you can, um, but I'd love to hear maybe from one or two people. And then also, what did that shift feel like to break out of form? What, I want to know what that actually felt like in your body, like a somatically, like, did you feel a sense of freedom? Did you feel a sense of like, what did that actually feel like for you? I'd love to hear from a couple people. Whether or not you want to talk about what that experience is like, or if you want to read a little bit of what you wrote, or maybe if you wanted to share a couple couplets and not the whole thing, all of the above. Jasmine. And then, is it Liza? Okay, Jasmine and then Liza. Hi again. <laughs> um, I, I wrote a little poem. Um... And somebody, I believe it was Ariana, that's how I say your name, she wrote in the chat um, this really insightful thing about like form being, uh, I literally wrote it down because I was like, I need this for later, but um, so 
I think of form as pouring a poem into a container to see how it moves and flows differently. Form being those various containers, it takes the pressure off the idea of having draft in form. So oh, this God. is a poem that I've been working on for a little bit. And I, I took that concept and thought about putting it into this form. So that's, yeah. Hey. Um, so my radith is eat it in a hurry and different variations of that. Um, too much touches on my plate and my tongue slobbers say eat it in a hurry. Though they'd smack my hand and I'd feel no compulsion to hurry. I'd fall asleep in my soup, curls dipping like finger food into a crab cocktail when I get my hands on some, hurrying. My belly spoke during the car ride home. Do you not feel tender with me? But I am small, told only eat. We hurry. So we run there and the sauce comes up, blood. But when I smile, satisfied and raw and in no hurry, they beg, I clean it up with myself, my hands, my mouth. I eat, I hurry. The skin under my teeth shrinks at the touch of trunks of acid of me, but I eat. I am little. Mm. I eat it in a hurry. Wow, thank you. It's absolutely interesting to hear it because it kind of starts in that slower form way. And then this cadence kind of takes over, which was me assuming that's when you were kind of breaking out a little bit. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I know we're getting close to time. Um, I see Liza, is it Kuhu? Am I saying your name correctly? And then Bonnie, but I understand if you need to leave. Um, and I totally understand that. And I just want to say thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to get through these people. And then um, I want to end with a poem about breaking all the rules. But if you have to go, I totally understand. And I really appreciate um, all of your time and writing with me today. Um, Jasmine, thank you for sharing. That was great. Um, I love that line about tenderness. Liza, let's go. OK. <clears throat> all right, let's see. <sighs> When I was four years old, my father pushed me on the playground swing. I sang the ABCs loudly and knew no shame. I'm 34. I conjure this memory, my father, the swing. When did I learn the ABCs of shame? Mm -hmm. I pump my legs, trying to get higher with no one pushing me. I'm trying to do something different. Little Liza, remember joy. Shame is not your name. Yes. Oh my gosh. Little Eliza, remember joy. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know what? I think in those really difficult memories to have a poem, try to remember joy, but for joy is so powerful. And it, it's interesting, like how that direct address is on, it's like big poet now speaking to little poet then. And I love those time travel moments inside of poems. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, is it Kuhu? Am I saying your name correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, Great. So I'm in New Delhi and it's, it's we're in like a really bad crisis uh, corona-wise right now. It's been hard to write, but I found that writing in form kind of helped me find some sort of language for that. So I'll read a little bit. Okay, thank you. We tell ourselves we're going to live forever. My mama is sick in hospital and I am afraid for her. I want to make palak juice for all of us. All those vitamins will help us to live forever. I'm not afraid all of the day, but most of the hours. Bodies keep burning with the ticking of the clock. Is everyone dying? Who, who are you listening to the cries of the temple still ringing? Kal, a million will be erased forever. Mm, thank you so much for sharing. Um, it was really gorgeous and devastating. And I think again, form can really siphon that really difficult content with grief um, and suffering. And I think it, it helps you contain when it's so, when it feels so impossible to write about somehow form can kind of help us enter into that kind of really difficult landscape. So I really appreciate you sharing that. It's gorgeous. Um, was there, was it Bonnie? I saw in the- Yes. Okay. Thank Bonnie. You. Luna's silvery gaze shines down on lovers as incandescent pearls glimmer. Two shadowy forms slither closer under the oak trees while incandescent pearls glimmer. Mm. One shadow longer than the other, wrapping itself, wrapping inside itself. Overshadowing the shorter by mere inches, incandescent pearls glimmer. 
Small shadow leans in. She's a hugger, you see. Whispering winds shake the leaves. They fall and cover the precious stones. Hidden now no from all sight, Luna moves behind some clouds. Lovers and pearls aren't the incandescent glimmer. What then could you discover? What is the gem? Tell me, dear Bonnie, what do you think causes the incandescent pearls to glimmer? Mm, gorgeous. I just love what, what happens when the poet addresses their name. It's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Bonnie. It's gorgeous. Um, okay, how do I say pronounce it? L-E-J-L-A? Layla. Layla. Okay, gotcha. Perfect. Thank you, Layla. All right, so... Sitting in the worn blue chair, calm on the surface, yet bombarded with worry. Blue pillow, blue skies, blue book, blue with worry. The colors are light in my room, as should be my mood, surely. My surroundings insignificant, the psyche is not still, just in a state of worry. My body is chained down with cold metal, yet my psyche is constantly telling me to hurry, hurry, hurry. Have you gone mad, woman? Curled up and concealed, slowly decayed, cause of death, worry. Mm. Worry some child, you should be free of these thoughts, following in the footsteps of the ones who came before you. As you were growing inside her flesh, your mother embarked on her journey. Oh, my child, you have adopted her stress. My dear Layla, you have so much left of your story, wasting the time you have left on foolish worry. Mm, thank you. I love how tender you are with, with your names. I love like, oh, my dear Layla, you know, it's so tender how we need to treat ourselves inside the poem and that there's so much left of your story. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. These are so wonderful, y'all. Um, okay, does anyone else feel like, sure, we might have time to hear from one more and then I will finish with the poem and then, okay. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna read this poem by Layla Shetty. We just had Layla go, another Layla. Um, this is called The Rules. And I just I just wanna end this workshop by, by saying, um, I want you all to find your own freedom inside form. I want you all to read the rules and then break the rules gloriously. Um, I want you to gain that sense of confidence and joy um, and persistence in your own journey as you figure out your own relationship to poetry. It's something that's been giving me a lot of joy in my work. Um, and I just thank you all for your time and your love and just writing with me today. It means so much to me. The rules, Leila Shetty. <clears throat> there will be no stars. The poem has had enough of them. I think we can agree we no longer believe there is anyone in any poem who is just now realizing they are dead. So let's stop talking about it. The skies of the poem are teeming with winged things and not a single anominate bird. You're welcome. Here, no monarchs, no moss, no cicadas doing whatever they do in the trees. If this poem is in summer punctuating the blue, forgive me. I forgot there is no blue in this poem. You'll find the occasional placented wasp Proposals vaporize and exorbitant, angels looking as they should. If winter, unsentimental sleet, this poem does not take place at dawn or dusk or noon or the witching hour or the crescendoing moment of our own remarkable birth. It is 2.53 in this poem, a Tuesday, and everyone in it is still at work. This poem has no children. It is trying to be taken seriously. This poem has no shards, no kittens, no myths or fairy tales, no pomegranates or rainbows, no ex-boyfriends or manifest lovers, no mothers, God, no mothers, no God, about which the poem must admit it's relieved. There is no heart in this poem, no bodily secretions, no body referred to as the body. No one dies or is dead in this poem. Everyone in this is alive and pretty okay with it. This poem will not use the word beautiful for it resists calling a thing what it is. So what if I'd like to tell you how I walked last night glad, truly glad for the first time in a year to be breathing in the cold dark to see them. The stars, I mean, oh hell, before something stops me, I nearly wept on the sidewalk at the sight of them all. Uh, I just wanted to end with that poem of joy of, you know, we all have a certain set of obsessions and to me, it's not about um, curating your obsessions, but actually lean into them. Um, so break all the rules, write about pomegranates as much as you want, make it new, make it fresh, um, but break all the rules. And so I really appreciate all of your time. I don't think we have time for a Q and A, but um, Sarah, what do you think? <laughs> I don't run over, but. No, I think <laughs> we, I, this was one of the best um, generative, and informative craft talks I've hosted um, at, yeah. at Vermont Studio Center. And um, thank you so much for inviting us to uh, in experiment with a form and also uh, inviting us to break the form and to feel freedom in both, in doing both. 
Um, I really appreciate your 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 hand your your approach. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah and um, also so generous and and holding space for everyone to be able to generate something new this morning too. And I loved everyone who shared. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of you. Um, and I, it's a lot of thanks and gratitudes blowing up in the chat right now. Yeah, yeah I really appreciate you all. I, I see it all, and I and I send a huge, huge. I'm gonna save the chat right now so I can read these all later. But um, all, all of your support and your gratitude. I see a lot of names that I love in here so much, and I really, really appreciate appreciate all of you so much. And if you do, if you're, if your broken puzzle turns into something, please let me know. I'd love to, I'd love to promote it out in the world. And I hope that you guys return to, um, you all, sorry, return to these drafts um, when you have some more time. And thank you, Sarah. For the yeah. Lot. Thanks. Thanks, Tiana. Um, please, if you don't already, buy Tiana's book, follow her. <laughs> um, and, and thank you so much for joining us.